Introduction to the Vikings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Johnson. The Vikings by Alan Maurer. Introduction. The term Viking is derived from the Old Norse vik, a bay, and means one who haunts a bay, creek, or fjord. In the ninth and 10th centuries, it came to be used more especially of those warriors who left their homes in Scandinavia and made raids on the chief European countries. This is the narrow and technically the only correct use of the term Viking, but in such expressions as Viking civilization, the Viking age, the Viking movement, Viking influence, the word has come to have a wider significance and is used as a concise and convenient term for describing the whole of the civilization, activity and influence of the Scandinavian peoples at a particular period in their history. And to apply the term Viking in its narrower sense to these movements would be as misleading as to write an account of the age of Elizabeth and label it the Buccaneers. It is in the broader sense that the term is employed in the present manual. Plundering and harrying form but one aspect of Viking activity, and it is mainly a matter of accident that this aspect is the one that looms largest in our minds. Our knowledge of the Viking movement was, until the last half-century, drawn almost entirely from the works of medieval Latin chroniclers, writing in monasteries, and other kindred schools of learning which had only too often felt the devastating hand of viking raiders they naturally regarded them as little better than pirates and they never tired of expatiating upon their cruelty and their violence it is only during the last fifty years or so that we have been able to revise our ideas of viking civilization and to form a juster conception of the part which it played in the history of europe the change has come about chiefly in two ways. In the first place, the literature of Scandinavia is no longer a sealed book to us. For our period, there are three chief groups of native authorities. One, the prose sagas and the Historia Danica of Saxo Grammaticus. Two, the Edaic poems. Three, the Skaldic poems. The prose saga and Saxo belong to a date considerably later than the Viking Age, but they include much valuable material referring to that period. The chief poems of the older Edda date from the Viking period itself and are invaluable for the information they give us as to the religion and mythology of the Scandinavian peoples at this time, the heroic stories current amongst them and their general outlook on life. The skaldic poems are, however, in some ways the most valuable historical authority for the period. The skalds, or court poets, were attached to the courts of kings and jarls, shared their adventures, praised their victories, and made songs of lament on their death, and their work is largely contemporary with the events they describe. Secondly, and yet more important in its results perhaps, archaeological science has, within the last half-century, made rapid advance and the work of archaeologists on the rich finds brought to light during the last hundred years has given us a vast body of concrete fact, with the aid of which we have been able to reconstruct the material civilization of the Viking period far more satisfactorily than we could from the scattered and fragmentary notices found in the sagas and elsewhere. The resultant picture calls for description later, but it is well to remember from the outset that it is a very different one from that commonly associated with the term Viking. With this word of explanation and note of warning, we may proceed to our main subject. End of introduction. Chapter 1 of the Vikings by Ellen Maurer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Johnson Chapter 1. Causes of the Viking Movement 
the period of scandinavian history to which the term viking is applied extends roughly from the middle of the eighth to the end of the tenth or the first half of the eleventh century its commencement was marked by the raids of scandinavian freebooters upon the coasts of england western scotland and ireland and upon frankish territory its climax was reached when in the course of the ninth and tenth centuries scandinavian rule was established in ireland man and the western islands the northern and midland districts of england normandy and a great part of russia its close was marked by the consolidation of the scandinavian kingdoms in the late tenth and early eleventh centuries under such mighty sovereigns as olaf Tryggvason and olaf the holy in norway olaf skotkonung in sweden and greatest of all king knut in denmark who for a brief time united the whole of scandinavia and a great part of the british isles in one vast confederacy the extent and importance of the movement is indicated from the first by the almost simultaneous appearance of trouble in england on the coast of france and on the eider boundary between denmark and the frankish empire in the reign of Beortric, king of wessex bracket seven eighty six to eight o two end of bracket three ships of the northmen coming from Horthaland, around hardanger fjord landed near dorchester in june seven ninety three lindisfarne was sacked in march eight hundred charlemagne found himself compelled to equip a fleet and establish a stronger coast guard to defend the frankish coast against the attacks of the northmen and from seven 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 onwards when the saxon patriot widukind took refuge with the danish king sigefridus bracket old norse sigrother and bracket there was almost constant friction along the land boundary between denmark and the frankish empire the outburst of hostile activity had been preceded by considerable intercourse of a varied character between scandinavia and the countries of western europe early in the sixth century the danes or according to another authority the gotar from gotaland in south sweden invaded frisia under their king chokilicus reference is made to this raid in the story of hygelac king of the gietas in beowulf professor zimmer suggested that the attacks of unknown pirates on the island of egg in the hebrides and on tory island off donegal described in certain irish annals of the seventh century were really the work of scandinavian raiders the evidence of irish legend and saga goes to prove that in the same century irish anchorites settled in the shetlands but were later compelled by the arrival of scandinavian settlers to move on to the lonely pharaohs here they were not to be left in peace for the irish geographer decuel writing in eight twenty five tells us that the pharaohs had then been deserted by the monks for some thirty years owing to the raids of northmen pirates dr jacobson has shown that the forms of place names in the shetlands point very definitively to a settlement from scandinavia in pre-viking days before seven hundred while the sculptured stones of gothland show already at the end of the seventh century clear evidence of celtic art influence possibly also merchants of scandinavian origin were already settled in the frankish empire and it is certain that there was considerable trade between scandinavia and the west most of the intercourse thus demonstrated was slow in development peaceful and civilizing in character how came it that in the latter years of the eighth century this intercourse was suddenly strengthened and intensified while at the same time it underwent a great change both in methods and character the traditional explanation is that given by Dudo and by william of jumieges in their histories of the settlement of normandy and by saxo in his account of danish settlements in baltic lands in the tenth century viz that the population of scandinavia had outgrown its means of support and that enforced emigration was the result there may be a certain element of truth in the tradition 
but when it says that this excess of population was due to polygamy we have every reason to doubt it polygamy does not lead to an over rapid growth of population as a whole and it is fairly certain that it was practiced only by the ruling classes in scandinavia it is quite possible however that the large number of sons in the ruling families made it necessary for the younger ones to go forth and gain for themselves fresh territories in new lands a clearer light is perhaps thrown on the matter if we examine the political conditions of the scandinavian countries at this time in norway we find that the concentration of kingly authority in the hands of harold fairhair after the middle of the ninth century led many of the more independent spirits to leave norway and adopt a viking life in the west or to settle in new homes in iceland so strong was the spirit of independence that when harold fairhair received the submission of the vikings of the west after the battle of hafersfjord many of them rather than endure even a shadowy overlordship abandoned their viking life and settled down to peaceful independence in iceland it is quite possible that earlier attempts at consolidation on the part of previous petty norwegian kings may have had similar results of the condition of sweden we know practically nothing but we have sufficient information about the course of events in denmark at this time to see that it probably tended to hasten the development of the viking movement throughout the first half of the ninth century there were repeated dynastic struggles accompanied probably by the exile voluntary or forced of many members of the rival factions external causes also were certainly not without influence from the sixth century down to the middle of the eighth the frisians were the great naval and trading power of northwest europe they had probably taken some part in the conquest of england and during the seventh and eighth centuries the whole of the coast of the netherlands from the scheldt to the wesser was in their hands their trade was extensive their chief city being durstead a few miles southeast of utrecht the northward expansion of the franks brought them into collision with the frisians in the seventh century the struggle was long and fierce but in the end the frisians were defeated by charles martel in 734 and finally subjugated by charlemagne in 785 the crushing of frisian naval power and the crippling of their trade probably played no unimportant part in facilitating the scandinavian advance and it is curious to note that while there is considerable archaeological evidence for peaceful intercourse between the west coast of norway and frisian lands in the eighth century the evidence seems to come to an end about the year 800 just when frisian power finally declined there can be no doubt also that the conquest of the saxons by charlemagne at the close of the eighth century bringing franks and danes face to face along the eider boundary made the latter uneasy there has been much arguing to and fro of the question as to the respective shares taken by danes and norwegians in the viking movement that of the swedes can fortunately be determined with a good deal more certainty the swedes were for the most part interested only in eastern europe and there by way of trade rather than of battle we learn from runic inscriptions and other sources that some swedes did visit england and the west but these visits were due to individual rather than national activity the question as between dane and norwegian has been to some extent made more difficult of settlement through the national prejudices of scandinavian scholars e g danes for the most part decide in favour of the danish origin of rollo of normandy while norwegians decide in favour of his norwegian birth such differences of opinion are unfortunately only too often possible owing to the scantiness of the material upon which we have to base our conclusions medieval chroniclers were for the most part unable or unwilling to distinguish between danes and norwegians they were all alike nordmanni to them and the term dani is practically interchangeable with it the vagueness of their ethnographic knowledge is manifest when we find the norman dudo at the beginning of the eleventh century 
tracing back the Danai, or Dakai, to an original home in Dacia. The Irish analyst did, however, draw a very definite distinction between Norwegians and Danes, Fingile and Dubgile, as they called them, white and black foreigners, respectively. They seem never to confuse them, but exactly on what grounds they give them their distinguishing epithets, it is now impossible to determine. They do not correspond to any known ethnographical differences, and the only other reasonable suggestion which has been offered is that the terms are used to describe some difference of armour or equipment as yet unknown to us. The Irish annals also distinguish between Donites or Danes and Lochlands or men from Lochlan, i.e. Norway. But again, the origin of the term Lochlan as applied to Norway is obscure. The writers of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle seem to use the term Northmen very definitely of Norwegians, just as Alfred does in his translation of Orosius. But the term Dene came to be used more vaguely and uncertainly. It is only very rarely that the chroniclers vouchsafe us precise information as to the home of any particular group of Viking raiders. We have already mentioned the presence of Norwegians from Hortheland in England at the very opening of the movement. Once we hear of Westfaldingi, i.e. men from Vestfold in South Norway, in an account of attacks on Aquitaine, and in one passage the Vikings are called Skaldingi, but it is disputed whether this means Vikings who had been quartering themselves in the valley of the Scheldt, or is a term applied to the Danes from the name of their royal family, viz. the Skjöldungar. Speaking roughly, we may however assert that Ireland, Scotland, and the Western Islands were almost entirely in the hands of Norwegian settlers. Bracket. Danish attacks on Ireland failed, for the most part. End of bracket. Northumbria was Norwegian, but East Anglia and the five boroughs were Danish. The attacks on France and the Netherlands were due both to Norwegians and Danes, probably with the preponderance of the latter, while Danes and Swedes alone settled in Baltic lands. End of chapter 1「The Viking Movement Down to the Middle of the Ninth Century » England was possibly the scene of the earliest Viking raids, but after the Dorchester raid, the sack of Lindisfarne in 793, and the devastation of the monastery of St. Paul's at Jarrow in 794, we hear nothing more of Vikings in England until 835. The fate of Ireland was different. Attacks began almost at the same time as in England, and continued without intermission. Vikings sailed round the west coast of Scotland. Skye and then Lambay Island, off Dublin, were invaded in 795. Glamorganshire was ravaged in the same year, and the Isle of Man was attacked in 798. Iona was plundered in 802 and again in 806. In 807, invaders appeared off the coast of Sligo and made their way inland as far as Roscommon, and in 811, Munster was plundered. In 821, the Howth Peninsula near Dublin and two small islands in Wexford Haven were ravaged. The Vikings had completely encircled Ireland with their fleets, and by the year 834 they had made their way well into the interior of the island, so that none were safe from their attacks. They no longer contented themselves with isolated raids. Large fleets began to visit Ireland and to anchor in the numerous lauks and harbours with which the coast abounds. Thence they made lengthy raids on the surrounding country and often strengthened their base by building forts on the shore of the lauks or harbours in which they had established themselves. It was in this way that Dublin, Waterford, 
and Limerick first rose to importance. Of the leaders of the Vikings at this time there is only one whose figure stands out at all clearly, and that is Turges, bracket, Old Norse Thorgester, end of bracket, who first appeared in 832 at the sack of Armagh. He had come to Ireland with a great and royal fleet, and assumed the sovereignty over the foreigners in Erin. He had fleets on Lauchneg, at Louth and on Lauk Ray, and raided the country as far south as the Meath district. Turges was not the only invader at this time. Indeed, so numerous were the invading hosts that the chronicles tell us, after this there came great sea-cast floods of foreigners into Erin, so that there was not a point thereof without a fleet. The power of Turges culminated in 841, when he drove the abbot of Armagh into exile, usurped the abbacy, and exercised the sovereignty of North Ireland. At the same time his wife Ota, bracket Old Norse Auther, end of bracket, profaned the monastery of Clonmacnois, and gave audience, probably as a vulva or prophetess, upon the high altar. Three years later Turges was captured by the Irish and drowned in Loch Owl, bracket, C.O. West Meath, end of bracket. The early attacks on England and the first invasion of Ireland were alike due to Norsemen rather than Danes. This is evident from their general course, from the explicit statement of the Anglo-Saxon chronicle, and from the fact that the first arrival of Danes in Ireland is definitely recorded in the year 849. The attack on Dorchester, bracket, circa 786 to 802, end of bracket, lying as it does near the centre of the south coast of England, is somewhat strange if it is assigned to the traditional date, viz. 787, but there is no authority for this, and if it is placed at any date nearer to 802, bracket, before which it must have taken place, end of bracket, it is probable that the attack may be explained as an extension of Viking raids down St. George's Channel and round the southwest corner of England. In 835, the attacks on England were renewed after an interval of 40 years, but as they now stand in close connection with contemporary invasions of Frankish territory, there is every reason to believe that they were of Danish rather than of Norse origin. The attacks began in the south and west, but they soon spread to East Anglia and Lindsay. In 842, the same army ravaged London, Etaples, and Rochester. In 851, Athelstan of Kent defeated the Danes at sea in one of the rare battles fought with them on their own element. And in the same year, they remained for the winter in Thanet, probably owing to the loss of their ships. The size and importance of these attacks may be gauged from the fact that in this year a fleet of some 350 Danish ships sailed up the Thames. It was probably that same fleet, with slightly diminished numbers, which in 852 ravaged Frisia and then sailed round the British Isles, came to Ireland and captured Dublin. In 855 the Danes wintered for the first time in Sheppe and we reached the same point in the development of their attacks on England, to which they had already attained in Ireland. We pass away from the period of raiding. The Danes now came prepared to stay for several years at a time, and to carry on their attacks with unceasing persistency. The course of events in the Frankish Empire ran on much the same lines as in England and Ireland during these years, except that here trouble arose on the land boundary between Denmark and the Franks, as well as on the sea coast. Alarmed by the conquest of the Saxons, the Danish king Gudroder collected a fleet at Slesvik, and in 808 he crossed the Eider and attacked the Abodriti, bracket, in Mecklenburg, Schweren, end of bracket, a Slavonic tribe in alliance with the Franks. He also sent a fleet of some 200 vessels to ravage the coast of Frisia, laid claim to that district and to Saxony, north of the Elbe, and threatened to attack Charlemagne in his own capital, 
the emperor was preparing to resist him when news arrived bracket eight ten end of bracket of the death of gudrother at the hands of one of his followers and the consequent dispersal of the danish fleet soon after disputes over the succession arose between the family of gudrother and that of an earlier king harold Ultimately, the contest resolved itself into one between the sons of Gudrother, especially one Horik, bracket Old Norse, Heriker, end of bracket, and a certain Harold. It lasted for several years, the sons of Gudrother, for the most part, maintaining their hold on Denmark. At one time, during the struggle, Harold and his brother Ragenfrother went to Vestfold in Norway, the extreme district of their realm whose chief and peoples were refusing to be made subject to them, and gained their submission, showing clearly that at this time Denmark and southern Norway were under one rule, and rendering probable the identification of Gudrother with Gudrother the Yingling, who about this time was slain by a retainer in Stifla Sound on the south coast of Norway. This king ruled over Vestfold, half Vingomork, and perhaps Agthir. Both parties were anxious to secure the support of the Emperor Louis, and in the end Harold gained his help by accepting baptism at Mainz in 826. He promised to promote the cause of Christianity in Denmark, while Louis, in return, granted him the district of Reustringen in Frisia as a place of retreat in case of necessity. The Danes thereby gained their first foothold within the empire. Sufficient has been said of the relation between Denmark and the empire on its land boundary. We must now say something of the attacks made by sea. The first were made in 799 on the coast of Aquitaine, and they were probably due to raiders from Ireland who followed a well-known trade route from South Ireland to the ports of southern France. In 800, Charlemagne inspected the coast from the Somme to the Seine and gave orders for the equipment of a fleet and the strengthening of the coast guard against Northmen pirates. When Gudrother's fleet plundered the islands off the Frisian coast in 810, Charlemagne gave orders for his fleet to be strengthened once more, but the results were meagre in the extreme. The passage of the Channel was no longer safe, and year after year, from some time before 819, Vikings harried the island of Normoitie at the mouth of the Loire, commanding the port of Nantes and the extensive salt trade of the district. The island of Ray, opposite La Rochelle, was raided in similar fashion. The Frankish Empire was free from attack between the years 814 and 833. During the same time, the English coast was also unvisited, and it is probable that the struggles for the succession in Denmark had for the time being reduced that kingdom to inactivity. About the year 830, the Danish king Hereker seems to have established himself firmly on the throne. Well, on the other hand, the emperor Louis was troubled by the ambition of his sons, Louis, Pippin, and Lothair. It is probably no chance coincidence that these events synchronized with the renewal of Viking attacks on Frisia. Throughout their history, the Vikings showed themselves well informed of the changing political conditions of the countries which they visited and ready to make the utmost use of the opportunities which these might give for successful invasion. Frisia was the main point of attack during the next few years. Four times was the rich trading town of Durstead ravaged. Fleets sailed up the Velt, the Maas, and the Scheldt. Antwerp was burned and the island of Walcheren plundered, so that by the year 840, the greater part of Frisia, north of the Vlie, was in Danish hands, and so it remained till the end of the century. The Danish king Hereker repeatedly denied all complicity in these raids, and even promised to punish the raiders, but it is impossible to tell how far his denials were genuine. Equally difficult is it to say how far Harold, in his Frisian home, was responsible for these attacks. The analysts charge him with complicity 
but Lewis seems to have thought it best to bind him by fresh gifts, and, bracket, probably about 839, end of bracket, granted the district round Durstead itself to him and his brother Rorik, bracket, Old Norse Rorikr, end of bracket, on condition that they helped to ward off Viking attacks. All the efforts of the emperor to equip a fleet or to defend the coast were to no purpose, and there was even a suspicion that the Frisian populace were in sympathy with the Vikings. So great was the terror of attack, that when in 839 a Byzantine mission, including some Rose or Swedes from Russia, visited the emperor at Ingelheim, the Swedes were for a time detained under suspicion as spies. On the death of Louis the Pious in 840, things went from bad to worse. The division of the empire in 843 gave the coast from the Eider to the Wesser to Lewis, from the Wesser to the Scheldt to Lothair, and the rest to Charles, removing all possibility of a united and organized defence, and soon these princes entered on the fatal policy of calling in the Vikings to assist them in their quarrels. Thus Lothair in 841 endeavoured to bind Harold to his cause by a grant of the islands of Walcheren, and Harold is found in the following year with Lothair's army on the Moselle. The Viking expeditions to England and France stand now in close connection. In 841 the valley of the Seine was ravaged as far as Rouen. In 842 Etaples in Picardy was destroyed by a fleet from England, while in 843 Nantes fell a prey to their attacks. From their permanent quarters at Noirmoitier, the Vikings sailed up the Garonne and penetrated inland as far as Toulouse. In 844, we hear from Arab historians of their vessels swarming on the coasts of Spain like dark red seabirds. But while they effected landings at Lisbon and Cadiz, and at Arzilla in Morocco, and captured Seville, with the exception of its citadel, the Mussulman resistance was too stout for them to effect much. As a result of this expedition, the emir of Cordova, Abid ar Rahman II, sent an embassy to the king of the Majus, bracket, i.e., the Magi, or the heathen, one of the commonest Arab names for the Vikings, end of bracket. The ambassador found the king living in an island three days' journey from the mainland, but we are told that the heathen occupied many other neighbouring isles, and the mainland also. He was courteously received by the king, and became an especial favourite with the queen Naud, bracket, question mark, old nurse Auther, end of bracket. His companions were alarmed at the intimacy, and as a result, the ambassador paid less frequent visits to court. The queen asked him why, and when he told her the reason, she said that, owing to perfect freedom of divorce, there was no jealousy among the Majus. The details of the story are too vague to admit of certainty, but it would seem as if the embassy had visited the court of the great Turges and his equally remarkable wife, Auther, in Ireland, or perhaps that of Olaf the White and his wife, Auther. In 845, Haraker of Denmark sailed up the Elbe and destroyed Hamburg, while in the same year the dreaded Ragnar Lothbrok, most famous of all Vikings, sailed up the Seine as far as Paris. While on its retreat from Paris, after the usual devastation, a strange and deadly disease, possibly some form of dysentery due to scantiness of food resulting from a hard winter, broke out in the Danish army. Various legends arose in connection with this event, and it finds a curious echo in the story told by Saxo Grammaticus of an expedition made by Ragnar among the Biarmians, bracket, in northern Russia, end of bracket, when that people, by their prayers, called down a plague of dysentery upon the Danes, in which large numbers perished. In the end, the historical plague was stayed when Herakr commanded the Vikings on their return to Denmark to refrain from flesh and meat for fourteen days. Whether as a result of the plague or from some other cause, Herakr now showed himself ready to come to terms with Lewis, 
and for the next eighty years there was complete peace along the Eider boundary. The whole of the coast was still open to attack, however. Frisia was hardly ever free from invaders. Brittany was obliged to buy off Danish attacks in 847, while Noimoitie continued to form a basis of attack against southern France in the Gironde district. The Viking invasions in France had attained much the same stage as that to which we have already traced them in England and Ireland. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of the Vikings by Ellen Mauer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Johnson. Chapter Three: The Vikings in England to the Death of Harthaknut. The great development of Viking activity, which took place after 855, was certainly not unconnected with the course of events in Denmark itself. Herakur was attacked by his two nephews in 850 and compelled to share the kingdom with them. In 854, large bands of Vikings returned to their fatherland after 20 years ravaging in Frankish territory. Trouble now arose between Herakur and his nephew Godurm, bracket Old Norse Gudormr, end of bracket, one of the returned leaders. Civil war broke out and ultimately after a great fight, the kingship fell on a younger Herakur, a relative of the late king. A severe dynastic struggle of this kind must have been accompanied by much unsettlement and perhaps by an actual proscription. It would certainly seem that there was some definite connection between these events and the coincident appearance of the sons of Ragnar Lothbrok as leaders of a more extended Viking movement both in England and in France. Three of his sons, Halfdaner, Ubi, and Ivar, took part in the first wintering in Sheppey in 855, while in the same year another son, Björn Ironside, appeared on the Seine. The figure of Ragnar Lothbrok himself belongs to an earlier generation, and great as was his after fame, we unfortunately know very little of his actual career. He would seem to have been of Norwegian birth, closely connected with the south of Norway and the house of Gudrother, and like that prince having extensive interests in Denmark. He probably visited Ireland in 831, for we read in Saxo of an expedition made by Ragnar to Ireland when he slew King Melbricus and ravaged Dublin, an event which is pretty certainly to be identified with an attack made on the Conile district, bracket C.O. Louth, end of bracket, by foreigners in 831, when the king Malbrigde was taken prisoner. He led the disastrous Seine expedition in 845. The next glimpse of him, which we have, is probably that found in certain Irish annals, where he is represented as exiled from his Norwegian patrimony and living with some of his sons in the Orkneys, while others were absent on expeditions to the British Isles, Spain, and Africa. And a runic inscription has been found at Maishau in the Orkneys, confirming the connection of the sons of Lothbrok and possibly of Lothbrok himself with those islands. The expeditions would be those mentioned above, and yet more famous one made to Spain, Africa and Italy by Björn Ironside in the years 859-62. to Ragnar Lothbrok's later history is uncertain. According to the Irish annals quoted above, his sons while on their expedition dreamed that their father had died in a land not his own, and on their return found it to be true. This agrees with Scandinavian tradition, according to which Ragnar met his death at the hands of Aile, king of Northumbria by whom he was thrown into a snake pit, while the capture of York by Ivar the Boneless in 866-7 is represented as part of a great expedition of vengeance undertaken by the sons of Ragnar. This tradition, bracket, apart from certain details, end of bracket, is probably historical, but we have no definite confirmatory evidence. <laughs> 
With this note on the history of Denmark at this time, and on the career of the most shadowy, if at the same time the most famous of the Viking leaders, we may turn once more to the history of events in England. For ten years after the wintering in Sheppey, England was left in a state of comparative peace. The change came in 866 when a large Danish force, which had been bribed to leave the Seine by Charles the Bald, sailed to England and took up its quarters in East Anglia. In 867 they crossed the Humber and captured York, the task being made easier by the quarrels of Eile and Osbert as to the kingship of Northumbria. Next year the rivals patched up their differences, but failed to recapture York from the Danes under Ivar and Ubi. Setting up a puppet king, Ekbert, in Northumbria north of the Tyne, the Danes next received the submission of Mercia and returned to York in 869. In 870 they marched through Mercia into East Anglia, as far as Thetford, engaged the forces of Edmund, king of East Anglia, defeated and slew him, whether in actual battle or in later martyrdom, as popular tradition would have it, is uncertain. The death of St. Edmund, king and martyr, soon became an event of European fame, and no Viking leader was more widely execrated than the cruel Ivar, who was deemed responsible. The turn of Wessex came next. The fortunes of battle fluctuated, but the accounts usually terminate with the ominous words, the Danes held possession of the battlefield. In 871, Alfred commenced his heroic struggle with the Danes, and in the first year of his reign, some nine pitched battles were fought, besides numerous small engagements. So keen was the West Saxon resistance that a truce was made in 871, and the Danes turned their attention to Mercia once more. London was forced to ransom itself at a heavy price, and a coin of half-danner, probably minted in London at the time, has been found. After a hurried visit to Northumbria, the Here settled down for the winter of 872-3 at Torxey in the Lindsay district, whence they moved in 873 to Repton in Derbyshire. They overthrew Burred of Mercia and set up a foolish thane of his as puppet ruler of that realm. In the winter of 874-5, the Here divided forces. One part went under half Danner to the Tyne Valley, the other under Guthorm, bracket, Old Norse Guthormer, end of bracket, to Cambridge. In 876, half Danner divided up the lands of Northumbria among his followers, who soon ploughed and cultivated them. At the same time, they did not forget their old occupations. Raids were made against the Picts, and the Strathclyde Welsh, while Half Danner soon became involved in the great struggle going on in Ireland at that time between Norsemen and Danes. This ultimately led to his death in 877. In the meantime, the struggle continued in Wessex. In 875, Alfred captured seven Danish ships. In 876, the southern division of the Here slipped past the West Saxon Fjord and reached Wareham in Dorsetshire but came to terms with Alfred. Though the peace was sworn with all solemnity on their sacred altar ring, the mounted portion of the Here slipped off once more and established themselves in Exeter. Their land forces were supported by a parallel movement of the fleet. At Exeter, Alfred made peace with them, and the Here returned to Mercia. There, half the land was divided up among the Danes, while the southern half was left in the hands of Kaelwulf. Alfred reached the nadir of his fortunes when the Here returned to Wessex in the winter of 877-8, drove many of the inhabitants into exile across the sea, and received the submission of the rest with the exception of King Alfred and a few followers who took refuge on the island of Athelne, amid the Somersetshire marshes. Alfred soon gathered round him a force with which he was able to issue from his stronghold and ultimately to inflict a great defeat on the Danes at Eddington, near Westbury. They now made terms with Alfred by the Peace of Wedmore, and agreed to leave Alfred's kingdom while their king, Guthrum, received Christian baptism. They withdrew first to Surencester, 
and then to East Anglia. Here they settled, portioning out the lands as they had done in Northumbria and northern Mercia. A peace was drawn up between Alfred and Guthrum of East Anglia, defining the boundary between their realms. It was to run along the Thames estuary to the mouth of the Lee, bracket a few miles east of London, end of bracket, then up the Lee to its source near Leighton Buzzard, and due north to Bedford, then eastwards up to the Ouse to Watling Street, somewhere near Fenny or Stony Stratford. From this point the boundary is left undefined, probably because the kingdoms of Alfred and Guthrum ceased to be conterminous here. England now had peace for some twelve years. Alfred made good use of the interval in reorganizing his army and strengthening the kingdom generally, so that when attacks were renewed in 892, he was much better prepared to meet them. In the autumn of that year, two fleets coming from France arrived in England. One landed on the Limen, bracket between Hythe and Romney Marsh, end of bracket. The other under the leadership of Hysten, bracket Old Nurse Haystein, end of bracket, at Milton in North Kent. Alfred's difficulties were increased by the fact that during the next four years, the Danish settlers in Northumbria and East Anglia played a more or less actively hostile part, both by land and sea. The Danes showed all their old mobility, and in a series of raids crossed England more than once. First to Buddington on the Severn, bracket C.O. Montgomery, end of bracket, then to Chester, and on a third occasion to Bridgenorth in Shropshire. They met with a uniformly stout and well-organized resistance under the leadership of Alfred, his son Edward the Elder, and his brother-in-law Ethelred of Mercia. And in the end, they had to retire with no fresh acquisition of territory. For the most part, they distributed themselves among the East Anglian and Northumbrian Danes, but those who had no cattle wherewith to stock their land took ship and sailed back to the Seine. There were no further attacks from abroad during Alfred's reign, but piratical raids made by the East Anglian and Northumbrian Danes caused him a good deal of trouble, and in order to meet them he definitely addressed himself to the long-delayed task of equipping a fleet. The vessels were carefully designed according to Alfred's own ideas. They were larger, swifter, and steadier than the Danish vessels, and they soon showed their worth when more than twenty vessels with their crews were lost by the Danes in one year. It is interesting to note that these vessels were manned in part by Frisian sailors, probably because of the low ebb to which England seamanship had sunk. When once Edward the Elder's claim to the throne was firmly established in the battle fought at the Holm, somewhere in South Cambridgeshire, he commenced, with the active cooperation of his brother-in-law, Ethelred, Elderman of Mercia, the great work of strengthening the hold of the English on southern Mercia preparatory to an attempt to reconquer the Danelog. Chester was rebuilt in 907. In 910, a fort was built at Bremsbrig, possibly Bromesbero, in Gloucestershire. Ethelred died in the next year, but his wife, Ethelflaed, the Lady of the Mercians, continued his work, and forts were built at Skergiat, perhaps Shrewsbury, at Bridgenorth, on the Severn, at Tamworth, and at Stafford, in 912. In 914, Warwick was fortified, while in 915, forts were built at Chirbury in Shropshire and Runcorn in Cheshire. On the death of Athelred, Edward took London and Oxford, and the parts of Mercia adhering to them into his own hands. Two forts were built on the north and south sides of the Lee at Hertford in 911-12, to and another at Whitham on the Blackwater in Essex. Edward's work soon bore fruit, for we read that in the same year a large number of those who had been under Danish rule now made submission to the king. The Danes in the five boroughs became restless under the continued advance of the English, and twice in the year 913 they made raids from Leicester and Northampton as far as Hook Norton in Oxfordshire and Leighton Buzzard. Well, in the next year, Edward, for the first time in his reign, 
was troubled by raiders from abroad. Coming from Brittany, they sailed up the Severn, ravaged South Wales and the Archenfield district of Herefordshire, but could do nothing against the garrison of Gloucester. Hereford and other neighbouring towns, which seem already to have been fortified, they were forced to leave the district, and so careful a watch did Edward keep over the coast of Somerset, Devon and Cornwall, that they could make no effective landing, though they tried twice, at Porlock and at Watchet. Ultimately, they took up their quarters in the islands of Flatholm and Steepholm in the Bristol Channel, but lack of food soon drove them away to Ireland in a starving condition. In the same year, Edward built two forts at Buckingham, one on each side of the Ouse, and his policy again found speedy justification when Earl Thurkeitel, bracket Old Norse Thorkeld, end of bracket, and all the chief men who obeyed Bedford, together with many of those who obeyed Northampton, submitted to him. Everything was now ready for the great advance against the Danes. Derby fell in 917, while in the next year Leicester yielded without a struggle. Their fall was accompanied by the submission of the men of Derbyshire and Leicestershire. At the same time, the inhabitants of York declared themselves ready to enter the service of Mercia. Edward fortified Bedford in 915, Malden and Towchester in South Northampshire in 916. Again the Danes from Northampton and Leicester tried to break through the steadily narrowing ring of forts, and they managed to get as far south as Aylesbury, while others from Huntingdon and East Anglia built a fort at Tempsford in Bedfordshire, near the junction of the Ivel and the Ouse. They besieged a fort at Wigingamere, bracket unidentified, end of bracket, but were forced to withdraw. Edward gathered an army from the nearest garrison towns, besieged, captured, and destroyed Tempsford, bracket 915, end of bracket. In the autumn, he captured Colchester and a Danish attempt on Malden failed. Edward now strengthened Towchester and received the submission of Earl Thurfrith, bracket Old Norse Thorother, end of bracket, and all the Danes in Northamptonshire, as far north as the Welland. Huntington was occupied about the same time, and the ring of forts around East Anglia brought about the submission of the whole of that district, Cambridgeshire making a separate compact on its own account. In 918, Edward built a fort just south of Stamford, and soon received the submission of the Danes of South Lincolnshire, and in the same year occupied Nottingham, building a fort and garrisoning it with a mixed English and Danish force. He was now ruler of the whole of Mercia, owing to the death of his sister, Ethelflaed, and in 919 he fortified Thelwall in Cheshire, on the Mercy, and rebuilt the old Roman fort at Manchester. In 920 he built a second fort at Nottingham, and one at Bakewell in Derbyshire. The reconquest of the Danelog was complete, and Edward now received the submission of the Scots, the Strathclyde Welsh, of Regnold, bracket Old Norse Roggenwalder, end of bracket, of Northumbria, and of English, Danes, and Norsemen alike. The Danish settlers accepted the sovereignty of the West Saxon king, and henceforward formed part of an expanded Wessex, which had consolidated its power over all England, south of a line drawn roughly from the Humber to the Dee. The submission of Roggenwalder, king of Northumbria, and the mention of Norsemen need some comment. On the death of Halfdanner in 877, an interregnum of seven years ensued, and then, in accordance with instructions given by St. Cuthbert, in a vision to Abbot Aedred of Carlisle, the Northumbrians chose a certain Guthred, bracket Old Norse Guthrother, end of bracket, as their king. He was possibly a nephew of the late king, ruled till 894, and was also known as Knut, bracket Old North Knuter, end of bracket. We have coins bearing the inscription Alfred Rex on the obverse and Knut Rex on the reverse, indicating apparently some overlordship of King Alfred. Together with these we have some coins with Knut Rex on the obverse and Sifredes, or bracket Sievert, end of bracket, 
on the reverse, and others minted at Ibroke Kivitas, bracket, i.e. York, end of bracket, with the sole inscription Sifredus Rex. This latter king would seem to have been first a subordinate partner and then, on Gudrother's death, sole ruler of Northumbria. Other coins belonging to about the same period and found in the great Curdale Horde near Preston bear the inscription Citric Comus. And there is good reason to believe that Sifredus, bracket Old Norse Sigrother, end of bracket, and Citric, bracket Old Norse Sigtriger, end of bracket, are to be identified with Sigfrith and Sitriuk, who just at this time are mentioned in the Irish annals as rival leaders of the Norsemen in Dublin. The identification is important as it shows us that Northumbria was now being brought into definite connection with the Norse kingdom of Dublin, and that the Norse element was asserting itself at the expense of the Danish in northern England. The rule of Sigrother and Sigtrigger alike had come to an end by 911, and we know nothing more until the year 918 when a fresh invasion from Ireland took place under a certain Roggenwalder. He gained a victory at Corbridge on Tyne and captured York in 919 or 920. He divided the lands of St. Cuthbert among his followers but died in 921, the year of his submission to the overlordship of Edward. The Irish annals speak of him as king of white and black foreigners alike, thus emphasizing the composite settlement of Northumbria. Another leader from Ireland, one Sigtrigger, succeeded Roggenwalder as king of Northumbria. He was on friendly terms with Athelstan and married his sister in 925. He died in 926 or 927, and then Athelstan took Northumbria under his own control. Sigtrigger's brother, Gudrother, submitted to Athelstan, but after four days at the court of King Athelstan, he returned to piracy, as a fish to the sea. Both Sigtrigger and Gudrother left sons bearing the name Anlaf, bracket Old Norse Olafur, end of bracket. And with them Athelstan and his successors had much trouble. Anlaf Sithrixen, lived in exile in Scotland and gradually organized against Athelstan a great confederacy of Scots, Strathclyde Welsh, and Vikings, both Danish and Norwegian. Anlaf Godfreyson brought help from Ireland, and the great struggle began. The course of the campaign is uncertain, but if the site of its main battle, Brunanburh, is to be identified with Birenswark Hill in southeast Dumfrieshire, it would seem that Athelstan carried the war into the enemy's country. The result of the battle was a complete victory for the forces of Athelstan and his brother Edmund. Constantine's son, five kings, and seven jarls were among the slain. We have in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle a poem celebrating the victory, and it describes in vivid language the hurried return home of Constantine, lamenting the death of his son and the headlong flight of Anlaf Godfreyson to Dublin. England had been freed from its greatest danger since the days of King Alfred and his struggle with Guthrum. Athelstan had no more trouble with the Norsemen, and we have evidence from other sources that at some time during his reign, probably at an earlier date, he exchanged embassies with Harold Fairhair, King of Norway. The latter sent him a present of a ship with a golden prow and purple sails, and the usual bulwark of shields along the gunwale, while Harold's favourite son, Hakon, was brought up at Athelstan's court. There he was baptised and educated, and is known in Norse history as Hakon Athelstane's Fostri. After the death of Athelstan, Anlaf Sithrixen, nicknamed Kuran, bracket i.e. with the sock or brogue of leather, so-called from his Irish dress, end of bracket, came to England and captured York. From there he made an attempt to conquer the Danish district of the five boroughs. He seems to have got a good part of Mercia into his hands, but in the end, Edmund freed the Danes from Norse oppression and took once more into his hands all Mercia, south of a line from Doré, bracket near Sheffield, end of bracket, 
to Whitwell, bracket, Derbyshire, end of bracket, and thence to the Humber. Edmund and Anlaf came to terms, but Anlaf was driven out by the Northumbrians in 943, and in the next year that province fell into the hands of Edmund. In 947, Eric Bloodaxe, son of Harold Fairhair, was accepted as king by the Northumbrians. In Scandinavian tradition, we learn how he was expelled from Norway in 934 by the supporters of Hakon, went on Viking raids in the west, was appointed ruler of Northumbria by Athelstan on condition of his defending it against attack, but was not on good terms with Edmund, who favoured one Olaf. Probably Eric retired after Athelstan's death and only returned to England in 947. In 948, Edmund forced the Northumbrians to abandon his cause, and about the same time Anlaf returned from Ireland and ruled till about 950, when he was replaced by Eric, whose short rule came to an end in 954. In that year, he was expelled by the Northumbrians and killed at Stainmoor in Westmoreland. The attempt to establish a Norse kingdom of Northumbria had failed, and henceforward that district was directly under the rule of the English king. English authority was supreme once more, even in those districts which were largely peopled with Scandinavian settlers. England had no further trouble with Norse or Danish invaders until the days of Ethelred the Unready, but no sooner did that weak and ill-advised king come to the throne than... With that ready and intimate knowledge of local conditions which they always displayed, we find Danes making an attack on Southampton and Norsemen one on Chester. The renewed attacks were not, however, due solely to the weakness of England. They were also the result of changed conditions in Scandinavia itself. In Denmark, the reign of Harold Bluetooth was drawing to a close, and the younger generation conscious of a strong and well-organized nation behind them, were ambitious of new and larger conquests, while at the same time many of them were in revolt against the definitely Christian policy of Harold in his old age. They turned with hope towards his young son Svein, and found in him a ready and willing leader. In Norway, Earl Hakon had broken away from the suzerainty of Harold Bluetooth, but the Norwegians could not forget that he owed his throne to a foreign power, and his personal harshness and licentiousness, as well as his zealous cult of the old heathen rites, were a cause of much discontent. The hopes of the younger generation were fixed on Olaf Tryggvason, a man filled with the spirit of the old Vikings. Captured by pirates from Estonia when still a child, he was discovered, ransomed and taken to Novgorod, where he entered the service of the Grand Duke Vladimir. Furnished by him with a ship, he went Viking in the Baltic, and then ten years later we find him prominent among the Norsemen who attacked England in the days of King Ethelred. In 991, a Norse fleet under Olaf visited Ipswich and Malden. Here they met with a stout resistance headed by the brave Beersnoth, Earl of Essex, and in the fragmentary lay of the fight at Malden, which has been preserved to us, we see that there was still much of the spirit of the heroic age left in the English nation, even in the days of Ethelred II. It was to buy off this attack that a payment of Danegeld, to the extent of some £10,000, was made. From Malden, Olaf went to Wales and Anglesey, and it was somewhere in the west that he received knowledge of the Christian faith from an anchorite and was baptised. He did not, however, renounce his Viking life, but joined forces with his great Danish contemporary Svein Forkbeard. Bamborough was sacked in 993, and both were present at the siege of London in 994, when they sailed up the Thames with 490 ships. The attack was a failure, and Olaf came to terms with Ethelred, agreeing to desist from further attack in return for a payment of £16,000 of Danegeld. Olaf was the more ready to make this promise, as he was now addressing himself to the task of gaining the sovereignty of Norway itself. Many of the Norsemen returned with Olaf, but the attacks on the coast continued, and the invaders, chiefly Danes now, 
ravaged the country in all directions. Treachery was rife in the English forces, and again and again the ealdormen failed in the hour of need. Danegeld after Danegeld was paid in the vain hope of buying off further attacks, and the almost incredible sum of a hundred and fifty eight thousand pounds of silver bracket i e some half million sterling end of bracket was paid as Danegeld during a period of little more than twenty years. Once or twice Ethelred showed signs of energy, once in one thousand, when a fleet was sent to Chester, which ravaged the Isle of Man, while an army devastated Cumberland, and again in a thousand and four, when a great fleet was made ready but ultimately proved of no use. Ethelred's worst stroke of policy was the order given in thousand and two for the massacre on St. Bryce's Day of all Danes settled in England. His orders were carried out only too faithfully, and among the slain was Svein's sister, Gunnhild, the wife of a Danish jarl in the king's service. Svein's vengeance was relentless, and during the next ten years the land had no peace until in 1013 Ethelred was driven from the throne, and Svein himself became king of England. Svein died in 1014, and his son Canute succeeded to his claim. Ethelred was invited by the Witan to return, and ultimately Wessex fell to Canute, while the district of the seven boroughs, bracket, the old five together with York and Chester, end of bracket, and Northumbria, passed into the hands of Ethelred, or rather of his energetic son, Edmund. This division of the country, placing the district once settled by Danes and Norsemen under an English king, while the heart of England itself was in the possession of a Scandinavian king, shows how completely the settlers in those districts had come to identify themselves with English interests as a whole. Mercia was nominally in Ethelred's power, but its earldoman, Eadric Streona, was the most treacherous of all the English earls. On Ethelred's death in 1016, the Witan chose Edmund Ironside as king, and a series of battles took place culminating in that at Ashington in Essex, where the English were completely defeated through the treachery of Eadric. A division of the kingdom was now made whereby Wessex fell to Edmund, Mercia and Northumbria to Canute. Thus easily was the allegiance of the various districts transferred from one sovereign to another. Edmund only lived a few months, and Canute then became king of all England. For twenty years the land enjoyed peace and prosperity. In 1018, the greater part of the Danish army and fleet returned to Denmark, some forty ships and their crews sufficing Canute for the defence of his kingdom. During the next four years he received the submission of the king of Scotland and made a memorable pilgrimage to Rome. The most important event of his latter years was, however, his struggle with Olaf the Stout, the great St. Olaf of Norway. Norway was now entirely independent of Danish sovereignty, and when Knut sent an embassy voicing the old claims of the Danish kings, he received a proudly independent answer from St. Olaf. For the time being, Knut had to be satisfied, but in 1025 he sailed with a fleet to Norway, only to suffer defeat at the Battle of the Helge Au, bracket, i.e. Holy River, end of bracket, in Skein, at the hands of the united forces of Norway and Sweden. Three years later, the attack was renewed. Olaf's strenuous and often cruel advocacy of the cause of Christianity had alienated many of his subjects, and the Swedes had deserted their ally. The result was that Olaf fled to Russia and Knut was declared king of Norway. Two years later the exile returned and fell fighting against his own countrymen. Knut was now the mightiest of all Scandinavian kings, but on his death in 1035 his empire fell apart. Norway went to his son Svein, Denmark to Hartha Knut, and England to Harald Harefoot. Harald was succeeded by Hartha Knut in 1040, but neither king was of the same stamp as Knut, and they were both overshadowed by the great Godwine, Earl of Wessex. When Hartha Knut died in 1042, the male line in descent from Knut was extinct, and though some of the Danes were in favour of choosing Knut's sister's son, Svein, 
Godwine secured the election of Edward the Confessor. With the accession of Edward, Danish rule in England was at an end. And, except for the ambitious expedition of Harold Hardrata, foiled at Stamford Bridge in 1066, there was no further serious question of a Scandinavian kingship either in or over England. The sufferings of England during the second period of invasion, bracket 980 to 1016, were probably quite as severe as in the worst days of Alfred, the well-known Sermo Lupi ad Anglos, written by Archbishop Wolfstan of York in 1014, draws a terrible picture of the chaos and anarchy then prevailing. But we must remember that neither these years nor the ensuing five and thirty years of Danish kingship left as deep a mark on England as the earlier wars and the settlements resulting from them. There was no further permanent occupation or division of territory and though some of the earldoms and the great estates passed into the hands of the king's Danish followers, there was no transformation of the whole social life of the people, such as had taken place in the old Danelag districts. End of chapter 3「Four of the Vikings by Alan Mauer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Johnson. Chapter Four: The Vikings in the Frankish Empire to the founding of Normandy. Bracket nine eleven and a bracket. The years from eight fifty to eight sixty five were perhaps the most unhappy in the whole history of the sufferings of the Frankish Empire under Viking attack. The Danes now took up more or less permanent quarters, often strongly fortified on the Scheldt, the Somme, the Seine, the Loire, and the Garonne, while Utrecht, Ghent, Amiens, Paris, Chartres, Tours, Blois, Orleans, Poitiers, Limoges, Bordeaux, and many other towns and cities were sacked, often more than once. When Florker obtained from the young Herriker of Denmark a concession of certain districts between the Eider and the sea, he gave trouble in that direction, and sailed up the Elbe and the Wesser alike. His nephew, Gudroder, was an occupation of Flanders and the lower valley of the Scheldt. Besides these Viking leaders, who were active in the Low Countries, we have the names of several others who were busy in France itself. The most famous of these were the sons of Ragnar Lothbrok, Berno, who first appeared on the Seine in 855, was Björn Ironside. While it is quite possible that the Sidrock, who accompanied him, was Sigurd Snake Eye, another son of that famous leader. With Björn, at least according to Norman tradition, came Hastingas, bracket, Old Norse, Haustein, end of bracket, his foster father. Haustein was destined to a long and active career. We first hear of him in the annals of 866, when he appeared on the Loire, and it was he who was one of the chief leaders in the great Danish invasion of England in 892-4. The sudden appearance of these leaders was undoubtedly due, as suggested in the previous chapter, to the turn of events in Denmark at this time. During the year of the Revolution, 854, no attacks were made on France at all, and then immediately after came a flood of invaders. The Seine was never free from 855 to 62, and the Loire district was little better off. The troubled and desolate condition of the country may be judged from the numerous royal decrees commending those who had been driven from their land to the protection of those with whom they had taken refuge, and exempting them from payment of the usual taxes. Many even deserted their Christian faith, and became worshippers of the gods of the heathen. The difficulties of Charles the Bald were greatly increased by succession troubles, both in Brittany and Aquitaine. Now one, now another claimant allied himself with the Northmen, and Charles himself was often an offender in this respect. He initiated the disastrous policy of buying off attack by the payment of large sums of what in England would have been called Danegeld. In 859 occurred an incident which throws a curious light on the condition of the country. 
the peasants between the Seine and the Loire rose of their own accord and attacked the Danes in the Seine valley. It is not quite clear what followed, but the rising was a failure, and possibly it was crushed by the Frankish nobles themselves, who feared anything in the nature of a popular rising, made without reference to their own authority. In any case, the incident bears witness to a lack of proper leadership by the nobles. After the year 865, the tide of invasion set from France towards England. These were the years of Alfred's great struggle, and Danish efforts were concentrated on the attempt to reduce that monarch to submission. The Franks themselves had begun to realise the necessity of more carefully organised resistance. They began building fortified bridges across the rivers at certain points in order to stop the passage of Viking ships and they also fortified several of their towns and cities, thus giving perhaps a hint for the policy later adopted in England by Edward the Elder. Probably the Franks were not above taking lessons from their enemies in the matter of fortification, for the latter had already shown themselves approved masters of the art in such fortified camps as that of Jufos on the Seine. In another way also, had the Danes showed themselves ready to adapt themselves to new fighting conditions. Not only did they build forts, but we hear of them as mounted, and henceforward horses played an important part in their equipment both in France and England. During these years the Vikings made one notable expedition far beyond the ordinary range of their activity. Starting from the Seine in 859, under the leadership of Björn and Haustein, they sailed round the Iberian Peninsula through the Straits of Gibraltar. They landed in Morocco and carried off prisoners, many of the Moors, or Blue Men, as they called them. Some of these found their way to Ireland and are mentioned in certain Irish annals of the period. After fresh attacks on Spain, they sailed to the Balearic Isles and Rosillon, which they penetrated as far as Arles sur Tech. They wintered in the island of Camargue, in the Rhone Delta and they raided the old Roman cities of Provence, and sailed up the Rhone itself as far as Valence. In the spring of the next year, they sailed to Italy. They captured Pisa and Luna, bracket, at the mouth of the Magra, end of bracket, the latter being taken by a clever stratagem. Haustein feigned himself sick unto death, and was baptized by the bishop of Luna during a truce. Then news came that Haustein was dead, and the Vikings asked Christian burial for him. Permission was given, and a mock funeral procession entered the city. It was in reality a band of armed men in disguise, and the city was soon captured. The real aim of the Vikings in this campaign was the capture of Rome, with its mighty treasures, but, for some reason unknown, they made no advance further south. Scandinavian tradition said it was because they mistook Luna for Rome, and thought their work already done. Sailing back through the Straits of Gibraltar, they returned to Brittany in 862. The Vikings had now almost encircled Europe with their attacks, for it was in the year 865 that the Swedish Rus, bracket Russians, end of bracket, laid siege to Constantinople. When Alfred secured a definite peace with the Danes in 878, those who were averse to settling permanently returned to their old roving life. They made their way up the Somme and the Scheldt, and their progress was not stopped by a brilliant victory gained by the young Louis III in June 881 at Socourt, near the Somme, a victory which is celebrated in the famous Ludwig's Lied. During the same years, another Viking host invaded Saxony, winning a decisive victory over Duke Bruno on the Lüneburg Heath. After their defeat at Saucourt, the main body of the Danes made their way to Elslu on the Meuse, whence they ravaged the Meuse, Rhine, and Moselle districts, plundering Cologne, Bonn, Koblenz, Aachen, Trevay, and Metz. So alarmed was the Emperor Charles the Fat that he entered into negotiations with the Danish king, Gudrother, who was with the forces at Elslu. He secured Gudrother's acceptance of Christianity and the promise of security from further attack at the price of a large payment of Danegeld, and the concession to Gudrother of the province once held by Froeker, with large additions. The exact extent of the grant is uncertain, but it included the district of Kinem 
bracket, round Elkmar and Harlem, end of bracket, and probably covered the greater part of modern Holland from the Vliet to the Scheldt. Here Gudrother lived in semi-independence, and might perhaps have established another Normandy within the empire had he not been ruined by too great ambition. He entirely failed to defend his province from attacks. Indeed, he probably gave them covert support. He intrigued with Hugo, the bastard son of Lothair II, against the emperor, married his sister Gisla, and then asked for additional territories on the Rhine and the Moselle on the plea that his own province included no vine-growing districts. Gudrother had now overstepped all reasonable limits. The emperor entered into negotiations with him, but secured his death by treachery, when a meeting was arranged near Cleve. With the fall of Gudrother, Danish rule in Frisia came to an end, and though we hear of isolated attacks, even during the early years of the 10th century, there was no more serious trouble in that district. In the autumn of 882, encouraged doubtless by the news of the death of Louis III, the Danes returned from the Meuse to Flanders, and during the next three years ravaged Flanders, Brabant, and Picardy, establishing themselves strongly at Louvain. In 885, they abandoned these districts and sailed up the Seine, after a nine years' absence. In November, they reached Paris, with a fighting force of some 30,000 men, and a fleet of seven hundred vessels. The passage up the river was stopped by fortified bridges, and the besiegers were fortunate in having as leader two men of great ability and courage, first Gauzelin, abbot of St. Germain's, and later Count Odo of Paris. The position of Paris was at times desperate. The Danes were exasperated by the stout defence and in their eagerness to plunder further up the river dragged many of their ships some two miles overland past Paris, and so reached the upper waters of the Seine. Later, as the result of peaceful negotiations, they obtained permission to pass the bridges on condition that they only ravaged Burgundy, leaving the Seine and Marne districts untouched. Thus had the provinces of the Frankish Empire lost all sense of corporate union. The Danes soon made their way as far west as Verdun. Here, however, they were disastrously routed by Odo, now king of the West Franks, bracket June 888, end of bracket. And in the next year, they finally abandoned the siege of Paris, making their way to Brittany. In Brittany, they found another army already busy. The Bretons had won a great victory in the autumn of 888, when only 400 out of some 15,000 Danes made their way back to their fleet. The great Herre from the Seine now joined forces with the remnants of this army, but proved powerless against Duke Elan, and some returned to Flanders in 890, while Haustain, with the rest, sailed to the Somme. The Danes in Flanders were defeated by Arnulf, bracket afterwards emperor, end of bracket, on the Dial near Louvain in 891, but it had no great effect, for soon after we find them again as far east as Bonn. A bad harvest in the summer of 892 brought famine in its train, and this was more effective in ridding the land of invaders. In the autumn of the year, the whole army, horses and all, crossed in one passage in some 250 ships from Boulogne to the mouth of the Limen in Kent, and, shortly after, Haustain, with a fleet of eighty ships, left the Somme and sailed to Milton in North Kent. The story of the campaigns there has already been told. For the first time since 840, the Frankish Empire was free from invaders. Grievous as were the losses of the Franks, it is well to remember that those of the Danes had been great also. Their fleet had been reduced from 700 to 250 ships, and as the whole army could still go to England in one crossing, that must also have been reduced from thirty to ten or fifteen thousand men. When the English invasion had failed, those who could not settle in England returned to their French haunts once more. A small force of eight ships and some two hundred men sailed up the Seine under one Hunkdeus, and gradually their numbers were increased by fresh arrivals from abroad. They made their way north to the Meuse, south to the Loire, and east to Burgundy, 
but their headquarters were on the lower waters of the Seine. In 903, other invaders appeared on the Loire under leaders named Barret, bracket, Old Norse Barder, end of bracket, and Herik, bracket, Old Norse Erker, end of bracket. The name of Barthur is mentioned more than once in the contemporary history of the Norsemen in Ireland, and as the Norsemen were driven from Dublin in 902, it is probable that these invaders came from there. The expedition was not a success, and the Vikings soon sailed away again. Of the history of the settlers on the Seine after 900, we unfortunately know practically nothing. The Norman historian Dudo attempted in the 11th century to give a connected account, but his narrative is confused and unreliable. Otto was dead and Charles the Simple was more interested in conquering Lorraine than defending Neustria. The clergy were wary of the ceaseless spoiling of the monasteries and anxious for the conversion of the heathen, while the nobles were, as usual, selfish and careless of the interests of the country at large. The Northmen made no great expeditions between 900 and 910, but maintained a steady hold on the lower Seine and the districts of Bessin and Cotentin. They could not extend their territories, and the Franks could not drive them from the Seine. At length, largely through the intervention of the clergy, a meeting was arranged between Charles and the Viking leader Rollo at St. Clair sur Epte before the end of 911. Here the province later known as Normandy, bracket, including the counties of Rouen, Lisieux, Evreux, and the district between the rivers Bressel and Ept and the sea, end of bracket, was given to Rollo and his followers as a beneficium, on condition that he defended the kingdom against attack, and himself accepted Christianity. The Danes now formed a definite part of the Frankish kingdom, and occupied a position analogous to that of their countrymen in East Anglia, Northumbria, and Mercia in England, except that the latter, after a period of freedom, had, in course of time, to pass definitely under English rule. The story of the foundation of Normandy is obscure. Still more obscure is the origin and history of the leader of the Northmen at this time. Norse tradition, as given by Snorri Sturluson, makes Rollo to be one Profer, son of Roggenwalder, Earl of Moor, who was exiled by Harold Fairhair and led a Viking life in the west. Norman tradition, as found in Dudo, made him out the son of a great noble in Denmark, who was expelled by the king and later went to England, Frisia, and northern France. Dudo's account of the founding of Normandy is so full of errors, clearly proven, that little reliance can be placed on his story of the origin of Rollo. The Heimskringla tradition was recorded much later, but is probably more trustworthy, and it would be no strange thing to find a man of Norse birth leading a Danish host. Ragnar Lothbrok and his sons were Norsemen, by family, but they appear for the most part as leaders of Danes. How Rollo came to be the leader of the Danes in France, and what his previous career had been, must remain an unsolved mystery. His name is not mentioned apart from the settlement of Normandy. The Normans continued to ravage Brittany without any interruption, and they were soon granted the further districts of Bayeux, Sies, Avranches, and Coutances, which made Brittany and Normandy conterminous. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5. The Vikings in Ireland to the Battle of Clontarf » In the history of the Vikings in Ireland, we have seen how the attempt made by Turges to bring all Ireland under one ruler came to naught by his death in 845. At first this seems to have thrown the Norsemen into confusion, and we hear of a series of defeats. Then, in 849, the invasions developed a new phase. Hitherto, while the Irish had been weakened by much internecine warfare, their enemies had worked with one mind and heart. Now we read of a naval expedition 
of seven score of the foreigners coming to exercise power over the foreigners who were before them, so that they disturbed all Ireland afterwards. This means that the Danes were now taking an active part in the invasions of Ireland, and we soon find them disputing the supremacy with the earlier Norse settlers. A full and picturesque account of the struggle is preserved for us in the second of the three fragments of Irish annals, copied by Dugald McFurbis. Unfortunately, the chronology of these annals is in a highly confused state, and it is often difficult to trace the exact sequence of events. When the Norsemen first saw the approaching fleet, they were much alarmed. Some said it was reinforcements from Norway, but others, with keener insight, said they were Danes, who were coming to hurry and plunder. A swift vessel was dispatched to find out who they were, and when the steersman called out to them inquiring from what land they came and whether as friend or foe, the only answer was a shower of arrows. A fierce battle ensued, in which the Danes killed thrice their own number and carried off the woman folk and property of the Norsemen. In 851, they plundered the Norse settlements at Dublin and Dundalk. But in the next year, the Norsemen attacked them in Carlingford, Lauch. At first the Danes were defeated, but then their leader cunningly exhorted his men to secure by their prayers and alms the patronage of St. Patrick, who was incensed against the Norsemen because of the many evil deeds they had wrought in Erin. The battle was renewed, and the Danes were victorious. After the battle, they made rich gifts to St. Patrick, for the Danes were a people with a kind of piety. They could for a time refrain from meat and from woman. After the fight, we learn that the Danes cooked their meat in cauldrons supported on the bodies of their dead foes. The Danes now helped Kerbal, king of Osori, against the Norsemen who were harrying Munster, and henceforward we hear again and again how the various Irish factions made use of the dissensions among the invaders to further their own ends. Matters were further complicated by the fact that many of the Irish forsook their Christian baptism and joined the Norsemen in their plundering. These recreant Irish were known as the Gael Guidehill, bracket, i.e. the foreign Irish, end of bracket and played an important part in the wars of the next few years. The Gaila Guide Hill were undoubtedly a race of mixed Norse and Gaelic stock, and we must not imagine that they sprung suddenly into existence at this time. Long before this, the Norsemen and the Giles must have had considerable peaceful intercourse with one another in their various settlements, and in accordance with well-established Scandinavian custom, it would seem that many of the Irish were brought up as foster children in Norse households and must soon have learned to accept their religion and customs. There was also extensive intermarriage between Norsemen and Irish. The annals speak of several such unions, the most famous being the marriage of Gormflaith, afterwards wife of Brian Boruma, to Anlaf Sithrixen. Well, in the genealogies of the Norse settlers in Iceland at the end of this century, Gaelic names are of frequent occurrence. One of the most famous of the leaders of these foreign Irish was Kettle Finn, bracket, i.e. the White, end of bracket, a Norseman with an Irish nickname. These foreign Irish fought either by the side of the foreigners or on their own account, and we have an interesting story telling how, when Vikings from Ireland made an invasion of Cheshire, bracket, circa 912, end of bracket, Ithelflaed, the Lady of the Mercians sent ambassadors to those Irish who were fighting on the side of the invaders, calling upon them to forsake the pagans and remember the old kindness shown in England to Irish soldiers and clergy. The troubles between Norsemen and Danes were probably responsible for the arrival in Ireland in 853 of Amhleib, son of the King of Norway, to receive the submission of the foreigners. This Amhleib is Olaf the White of Norse tradition. Olaf is represented as ruling together with his brother, Imhar, bracket Old Norse Ivar, end of bracket. The annals are not very good authority for the relationship of the Norse leaders to one another, and it is quite possible that Ivar is really Ivar the Boneless, 
son of Ragnar Lothbroke, under the strong rule of Olaf and Ivar, Dublin became the chief centre of Scandinavian rule in Ireland, and the Danes and Norsemen were to some extent reconciled to one another. The Irish suffered great losses, but some brave leaders were found to face the Norsemen. Kennedig, king of lakes, bracket, Queen's County, end of bracket, came upon a party of them laden with booty. They abandoned the spoil and rushed upon Kennedig with angry barbarous shouts, blowing their trumpets and many of them crying Nui, Nui, bracket, i.e., probably in the Old Norse speech, Kanui, Kanui, hasten on, hasten on, end of bracket. Many darts and spears were thrown, and at last they took to their heavy, powerful swords. All was, however, of no avail, and Kennedig won a great victory. Less fortunate was Malkirain, champion of the east of Ireland and a hero plunderer of the foreigners. He was expelled from his kingdom by the Leinstermen, who envied him in consequence of his many victories over the Norsemen. The activities of Olaf and Ivar were not confined to Ireland. In 866, Olaf paid a visit to Scotland, while in 870, both Olaf and Ivar were present at the siege of Dumbarton. If Ivar is Ivar the Boneless, he must then have gone to England and taken part in the martyrdom of St. Edmund. In the next year, both leaders returned to Dublin with a large number of prisoners, English, Britons, and Picts. In 873, Ivar, king of the Norsemen, of all Ireland and Britain, died, and about the same time Olaf returned to Norway, possibly to take part in the great fight against Harold Fairhair at Haffersfjord. The Danes seem to have taken advantage of the removal of Olaf to attempt to throw off the Norse yoke. Fresh fighting took place, and the Danes under Albdon, i.e. Hofdonner, king of Northumbria, were defeated on Strangford Lauch in 877 with the loss of their leader. After 877, the War of the Guide Hill with the Gael notes a period of rest for Ireland, lasting some 40 years. This is true to the extent that no large fleets of fresh invaders seem to have come to Ireland during this time. The Vikings were too busy elsewhere, both in England and the Frankish Empire, but there were occasional raids from Dublin, Cork, Limerick, Waterford, and other towns into various districts of Ireland, and the Norsemen were often at variance amongst themselves. Dissensions in Dublin were particularly violent, and so much did they weaken Norse rule there that in 902 Dublin fell into the hands of the Irish. The Vikings were driven abroad, some going to Scotland and others to England, where they besieged Chester. In the year 914, all the old troubles were renewed. Roggenwalder, a grandson of Ivar, fresh from a great victory off the Isle of Man, captured Waterford, and two years later Sigtrigger, another grandson of Ivar, regained Dublin. The Irish attempted resistance under the Ardri Nial Glundub, but he fell with twelve other kings in a fight at Kilmagshoog near Dublin in 919. During the next fifty years, Ireland was a prey to ceaseless attacks by Norwegians and Danes alike. Towards the close of the ninth century, Limerick had become a stronghold of the Norsemen in the west, and from there they made their way up the Shannon into the heart of the country. Cork was settled in the early years of the 10th century, chiefly by Danes, and from there all Munster was open to attack. Waterford and Wexford, which stood as a rule in close connection with Dublin, served as centres of attack against Leinster. The Irish made a stout resistance under able leaders, and Dublin was destroyed more than once. First among these leaders stands Mur Chertach, of the Leather Cloaks, son of Njal Glundub, a hero who came forward about the year 926. His activities were unceasing. He repeatedly attacked Dublin, took a fleet to the Hebrides where he defeated the Vikings, gaining much spoil, and finally in 941 made a circuit of Ireland, from which he brought back as hostages many provincial kings, including the Norse ruler of Dublin. More famous still in Irish song and story was Kelachan of Cashel. He made war against the Vikings in Munster 
and for a time had the Norse kingdom of Waterford under his control. Similarly he conquered Limerick, and we find him fighting side by side with Norsemen from both these towns. During these fifty years the Norse kingdom in Dublin stood in close relation with the Scandinavian kingdom of Northumbria. Roggenwalder, who died in 912, ruled there and so did his brothers, Sigtrygr, bracket, died 927, end of bracket, and Guthrother, bracket, or Godfrey, end of bracket, bracket, died 934, end of bracket. The brothers left sons, known respectively as Anlaf Sithrixen and Anlaf Godfreyson. The latter took part in the great fight at Brunanburh and died in 939. Anlaf Sithrixen was destined to a longer career. He would seem to have spent his early years in Scotland, where he married King Constantine's daughter. It is uncertain whether he fought at Brunanburh, but he came to Northumbria in 941 and captured York. He was expelled from Northumbria in 944 or 945 and retired to Dublin, and the rest of his life was chiefly spent in fighting in Ireland. He was in close alliance with the Norsemen in Man and the Western Islands, and was, for some thirty years, the most powerful Norse ruler in Ireland. Then came the first great blow to Norse rule in Ireland. In 980, Milesichlein II, the Ardri, won a great victory at Tara over the foreigners of Dublin, and the islands in which Anlaf's son was slain. The power of the Kingdom of Dublin was effectually broken. The Norsemen were compelled to liberate all the hostages in their custody, to pay a fine of 2,000 oxen, and to remit the tribute which they had imposed on all Ireland from the Shannon eastward to the sea. Anlaf abandoned his authority and retired on a pilgrimage to Iona, where he died in the same year an inmate of its monastery. In the meantime events, fraught with important consequences for Norse rule in that country, were gradually developing in a distant quarter of Ireland. In the province of Munster, the Delcassian line of princes first comes into prominence about the middle of the 10th century, and the two most famous of these princes were the brothers Mathgamhain and Brian, commonly known as Brian Boruma. Together the brothers conquered Munster in spite of the support given to the Irish by the Viking settlers, and when their success aroused Ivar, the ruler of Limerick, they attacked him and won a great victory at Solcoit near Tipperary, bracket 968, end of bracket. Limerick was captured, Mathgamhain died in 976, and Brian was soon acknowledged king of all Munster. He next became master of Leinster, but his rapid advance brought him into conflict with the Ardri, and by a compact made in 998, Milesetchlain practically surrendered the southern half of Ireland to Brian. The ruler of Dublin at this time was Sigtrygr of the Silken Beard, son of Onlof and Gormflaith, sister of Malamorda, king of Leinster. In 1000, Leinster, with the support of the Norsemen in Dublin, revolted. But Brian defeated them and captured Dublin, giving his daughter in marriage to Sigtrygr and himself marrying Gormflaith. In 1002, Malsechclain submitted to Brian, and the latter became Ardri. There followed twelve years of peace, but Brian's marriage with Gormflaith was his undoing. Quarrelling with her husband, she stirred up Malmorda of Leinster against him. An alliance was formed between Malmorda and Sigtrygr, and Gormflaith dispatched embassies to all the Viking settlements in the west, summoning them to the aid of Sigtrygr in a great fight against Brian. Sigtrygr secured the help of Earl Sigurd of the Orkneys, and North Scotland by promise of the kingship of Dublin. Ships came from all parts of the Viking world, from Northumbria, from Man, and the Western Islands, from Scotland and the Orkneys, and even from Iceland. Dublin was fixed as the trysting place, and Palm Sunday 1014 was to be the time of meeting. Brian mustered all the forces of Munster and Connacht, and was joined in half-hearted fashion by Malsechclain, who was really waiting to see which way the fortunes of war would turn. Brian advanced into the plain of Fingal, north of Dublin, and the two armies faced one another at Clontarf 
all passion weak. The Norsemen had learned by magic incantations that if the fight took place before Good Friday, their chiefs would perish and their forces be routed, while if the fight took place on Good Friday, Brian himself would perish, but the Irish would win the day. So they waited until the Friday, and then made their attack. The fight was long, and the slaughter was terrible. Brian and Sigurd were themselves numbered among the slain. In the end, the Norsemen were defeated, and Malseclain completed their discomfiture when he cut down the fugitives as they tried to cross the bridge leading to Dublin, and so reached their ships. No fight was more famous in Irish history, and it seems to have appealed with equally strong force to Scandinavian imagination. Clontarf and Runanbur are the two great Viking battles, which find record in Scandinavian saga and in the story of Burnt Njal. We have a vivid account both of the actual battle and of the events leading up to it. Yet more interesting, perhaps, is the old lay preserved to us, the Song of the Valkyries, who that same day were seen in Caithness, riding twelve together to a bower where they set up a loom of which men's heads were the weights, men's entrails the warp and woof, while a sword was the shuttle and the reels were arrows. They wove the web of war and foretold the fate of King Sigtrigger and Earl Sigurd, as well as the sharp sorrow which would befall the Irish. The Norse world was full of this and like portents, and there can be no question that the Vikings were themselves conscious that the Battle of Clontarf marked a very definite epoch in the history of the Vikings in the West, and in Ireland more particularly. The Norsemen remained in possession of their cities. Sigtrigur continued as king of Dublin, but gradually the fortunes of the Norse settlers tended to become merged in the history of the nation as a whole, and there was no further question of Scandinavian supremacy in Ireland. End of chapter 5《ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキングズ・ヴィキング We have seen how early they formed settlements in the Shetlands, and they soon reached the Orkneys and the Hebrides. From the Orkneys they crossed to the mainland, to Sutherland and Caithness. The very names bear witness to Scandinavian occupation, while Galloway, bracket, i.e., the land of the Gyle and Guide Hill, end of bracket, was settled from the Isle of Man. Already in the ninth century, The Norse element in the Hebrides was so strong that the Irish called the islands Insi Gaul, bracket, i.e., the islands of the foreigners, end of bracket, and their inhabitants were known as Gael Gaidhil. The Norsemen called the islands Suthraithyar, bracket, i.e., southern islands, end of bracket, in contrast to the Orkneys and Shetlands, which were known as Northraithyar, and the name survives in the composite bishopric. Of Sodor and Man, which once formed part of the Archdiocese of Trondheim in Norway. The Isle of Man was plundered almost as early as any of the islands of the West, and it was probably from Man that the Norse settlements in Cumberland and Westmoreland were established. Olaf the White and Ivar made more than one expedition from Ireland to the lowlands of Scotland, and the former was married to Auther, the daughter of Kettle Flatnose. Who had made himself the greatest chieftain in the Western Islands. After the Battle of Hafrsfjord, when Harold Fairhair had finally crushed his rivals in Norway itself, so powerful were the Norse settlements in the West that he felt his position would be insecure until he had received their submission. Accordingly, he made a great expedition to the Shetlands, Orkneys, and the west coast of Scotland. Fulfilled this purpose and entrusted the northern islands to Sigurd, brother of Rogenwalder, Earl of Moor, as his vassal. The history of the Norse settlements in the Orkneys is well and fully told in the Orkneyinga saga, 
The first Orkney earl was the above-named Sigurd. He entered into an alliance with Thorstein the Red, son to Olaf the White, and together they conquered Caithness and Sutherland, as far south as the river Oikel, on the borders of Ross and Cromarty. Sigurd's son Einar, known as Turf Einar, because he first taught the islanders to cut peat for fuel, founded a long line of earls of the Orkneys. He had a quarrel with Harold Fairhair, and when that king imposed a fine on the islanders for the murder of his son, and the farmers could not pay it, Einar paid it himself, on condition that the peasants surrendered their othal rights, i.e. their rights of possession in the lands they cultivated. Turf Einar's son, Sigurd the Stout, was the most famous of all the Orkney earls, renowned both as warrior and poet. He conquered Sutherland, Caithness, Ross, Moray, Argyll, the Hebrides, and Man, securing the support of the men of Orkney by giving them back their Othal. He married a daughter of Malcolm, king of Scotland, and met his end, as we have already seen, fighting on the side of the heathen Norsemen in the Battle of Clontarf in 1014. After this, the power of the Orkney earls declined. The Norse line of earls was replaced by one of Scottish descent in 1231, but the islands did not pass definitely to the Scottish crown until the 15th century. Of the Norse settlements in the Hebrides we have no such definite or continuous record. Mention is made in Irish annals of the middle of the 9th century of a king in the Hebrides, one Gudrother, son of Fergus, whose very name shows him to have been one of the Gael Gaidhil. Kettlefin was another such. In the latter half of the 9th century, Kettle Flatnose was the chief Norse leader in the Hebrides, until his power was destroyed by Harold Fairhair. Many of the settlers then betook themselves to Iceland, the most famous of them being Auther the Deep Thoughted, widow of Olaf the White and daughter of Ketil. Norse rule was all-powerful during the 10th and 11th centuries. There was a line of kings, but we find ruling side by side with them certain officers known as lawmen. Well, in the late 10th and for the greater part of the 11th century, the Hebrides were under the sovereignty of the Orkney earls. Norse rule in the Hebrides did not finally come to an end until 1266, when Magnus Hakonsen, king of Norway, renounced all claims to the islands. The early history of the settlements in Man is equally obscure. At first the island suffered from repeated raids, then about the middle of the ninth century it passed under the authority of the kings of Dublin, and remained so until, with the Hebrides and western Scotland generally, it was conquered by Sigurd the Orkney Earl. From the Orkney Earls it passed to the great conqueror Godred Crovan, the king of Gori, or Ori, of Manx tradition, who came from the Hebrides, and his successors down to the cession of the islands in 1266, were known as kings of man and the isles of the details of the settlement of the scottish mainland of caithness sutherland and galloway of the occupation of cumberland and westmoreland we know almost nothing but when we speak later of norse influence in these districts we shall realize how strong was their hold on them our knowledge of the norse occupation of man and the islands is somewhat scanty in detail but there can be no question that their settlements in lands, often closely resembling in physical features their own home country, were of the highest importance. End of chapter 6